was this lifestyle mm -hmm. ever put in your face in any way? Were you, were you ever living in the house when your mom had Johns come into the house? Or is this something that she kept completely separate from you and your brother? Well, on this particular uh, one occasion that I can remember, and it almost cost me my life, uh, they're running a date. And my mom usually never got that sloppy. But she was with my aunt and she got sloppy that day. And this guy that they had robbed for all his money, a Spanish gentleman, he remembered where he was. So he came back to the house to kill my mom and my aunt. I was there alone and he attacks me, stabs me in the neck with a screwdriver when I was nine. And I was laid out for dead. So he beat me up real bad, stabbed me in the neck with a screwdriver, left me for dead. I could have laid there and died, but at nine years old, I get up, walk next door where my brother's playing Atari video games. They call the ambulance and by the grace of God, <laughs> I'm still here. You gotta be kidding me. No, true story, brother. Let's I, because you glossed over that. I, I need to get into some details with that. <laughs> All right. It, and walk this uh, audience through because this is okay. nine years old. Right. This is a, a, a very, very uh, impressionable age. Mm -hmm. It sets the foundation, at least some of the building blocks on who you're going to become later in this life. Right. Okay. Your mom has a John. Uh huh. Her and your aunt robbed this gentleman. Right. He remembers where she lives. Right. He comes back. Is he looking for them or is he just looking for anybody I can find? Well, well, here's the situation. He comes, I'm laying in the bed and he comes to sit on the edge of the bed like he's going to read me a story. Is there anybody else home at the time? Nobody's at home at the time. It's just me. And when the act is going on, I'm next door playing the video games with my brother. Okay. So I go home and I leave the door unlocked for him to come home. For your brother? For my brother. So okay. the door wasn't locked. We only had one key to the house and I had it. So I leave the door unlocked. We're living in the projects, but these projects had stairs. So I go into my room. I'm laying in bed. And when I hear the footsteps coming down the hallway, I really get excited because I'm thinking mom coming home early or my brother's coming home. And so when I see the man walking through the door, I, I'm not afraid because I'm used to seeing people come and go in this place I call home, right? Yep. So the man comes and sit on the edge of the bed. And I, I kind of sit up and I'm looking at him and I'm like, okay, hey man, what's going on? And he asked me, where's your mama? And I said, I guess she's in the flats. And the flats is a place where everybody hung out, you know, drugs, music, dance halls and stuff like that. So I guess I said, I guess she's at the flats. And I was about to tell the man, go wait for her in her room. Right. Yep. And when I said that, the man grabbed me, wrapped the bandana around my neck, put a pillow over my face and start punching me. The first punch would knock me out. The second punch would wake me up. Wow. <laughs> you know, so at nine years old, my life is almost over before it ever starts. Right. Mm -hmm. So now the guy lets me up and I'm gasping for air because he had this bandana around him and beat me up. And I'm thinking he fit to let me go. Right. And then he just grabs and stabs me in the neck with a screwdriver. So now I can't breathe. I I'm gasping. Now I got this blood coming out of my neck. So the next thing I do, I'm grabbing my neck and we live in these uh, housing projects, right? So, you know, it's government housing. So I slide between the bed and the wall because I'm trying to fight for my life now. Now I know I'm in danger. Mm -hmm. So I roll up under the bed and I remember I'm face down and I can remember I can smell the bleach, the comet from the baseboards we had clean for HUD housing so we can pass the inspection so we can have somewhere to live. I'm face down and this guy is trying to move the bed. And it was one of those bunk beds. You remember them old school bunk beds with the wood sticks? Yes, sir. Just, okay, we had those, but they were side by side because me and my brother had broke them. So this guy's trying to flip over this bed to get me, but he can't. So I'm kind of holding on to the bottom. 
bleeding out of the neck. So only thing I really remember of this guy is his bottom of his blue jeans and his snakeskin boots. And he panics and runs away. And when I hear the back door slams, that's when I know I think I'm safe to get up. Wow. How bad was the stab to your neck? You got stabbed in your neck with a screwdriver. Yes. Uh, I still got the scar. You know, sometimes, you know, people ask when you're on stage speaking and I kind of show it, it's right here. I don't know. It's still right here. It's like mm -hmm. right here. And uh, man, I don't know, really. And at that time, I didn't even know my life was really in danger, you know. And, you know, once I go next door, I fall into my brother's arms. Uh, the neighbors call the ambulance. And my mom, she was known in the city of doing what she do. And a lot of people saying, well, Louise, her dirty games finally caught up with her. Her son just been murdered. So people had already pronounced me dead. So I remember going on the stretcher and my mom shows up on the scene and she says, don't tell him nothing. Hold on, wait right there for a second. <laughs> is this the first words your mother said? Is, is, it, is it, how's he doing, um, baby? You gonna be all right? No. Is none of that? No, she says, don't tell him nothing. Cause she knew I was street smart. She knew I had already put two and two together. And the paramedic says, if we didn't get here in time, this boy would have bled to death. So that, that's how that whole incident went down. Did there ever come a day surrounding that incident when your mother talked about it with you, apologized to you, expressed sorrow, expressed some type of remorse that her son, nine years old, right. uh, almost lost his life because of something that she had done. Right. Well, here's the situation. We talked about it one time and one time only. So initially, you know, I'm at the hospital and detectives of everywhere asking me questions saying, who's the guy that broke in the house? Who's the guy that did this to you? Why did they come attack you? So listening to mama, I lied to the cops. I said, man, they broke into to rob us. And then the, the cop laughed at it. He said, nobody breaks into the projects, <laughs> you know? And so my mom didn't show up to the hospital for about two or three days because she was afraid they was gonna arrest her or I was gonna break and tell the truth. So when she finally showed up to the hospital, she's looking at me and the doctor's in there because now my blush, my eyes are bloodshot red. So where the white in your eyes is, it's all red mm -hmm. and just this black. And so the doctor's telling my mom that he's never seen a bloodshot condition this bad. And if the pills don't work, we're going to have to scrape his eyeballs to wow. get this blood off of his eyes. And so at this time, I've never seen my face. And so my mom is starting to cry and she's break down crying and she said, son, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I was like, man, mom, it's okay. And I turned around and found myself confident in her because a boy, you don't want to see your mama hurt and crying, right? And so I didn't know why she was crying because I didn't know what I looked like. So I'm in the second grade. I get up, I walk to the mirror and I see my face and I look like Emmett Till. Wow. It was just all knots and bloody eyes and big face and I was all mixed up. And at that point, I started to cry because I thought my face was gonna stay like that. And that's the only time we ever talked about that. We didn't. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So never in life, we, we ever talked about it again. It was just kind of like, it was just something that happened and move on from it. Let, let me ask you, what, what, what happens in the aftermath of something mm -hmm. like that? Are you taken from your mother? Your mother didn't show up to the hospital for three days. Mm -hmm. Obviously, any of the, the, the <clears throat> doctors, the, the administrators, they, this is red flags. You know, yeah. where the boy's mother at? Uh, right. So, you know, what, so what happened is, like in West Texas, uh, nothing really happened. The thing happened, we was punished. 
I almost lose my life. And because of me almost losing my life, I lose my home. They evict us because of the incident. So now we're homeless. So I go live with my grandma, me and my brother. They don't take me from my mom because I lie and say, this is just an incident. You see what I'm saying? This is something that just happened. So we get evicted because you can't have any crime or anything like that to make the news. So we go live with my grandma and we stay with her for a few years off and on and mom would come and give her money or whatever for us to stay there. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.